Thursday, 14th of March, listener. Rubbing my hands with glee because we've got another show of shows for you today. Uh, Duncan Alexander's here. Hello, Duncan. Hello. Also, Raphael Honigstein. Hello, James. Nice to see you, Raph. And Tom Williams. Hello, James. Tom, have you brought a copy of your new book, Va Va Voom? I have not, oh. but we'll be getting my hands on it oh. shortly. When Within is it? Within the next couple of weeks. So it's out April 25th. Oh, right. Available for pre order already. Coming out in ebook and audio book. I convened a brainstorming session about the title. Oh yeah, a few months back. Oh yeah, some, what were the other some options? Some totally favourites. So the book Duncan, is about. It's a history of French football. It is the modern history of French football, which would be a great title in itself. But what well, that's was, the subtitle. Okay, what were the other options? There were there were many. Okay. Um, there were many, uh, and Duncan's contribution. But as was many as Big Farmer, which did not did not make <laughs> the final I mean, it's good. final <laughs> shortlist. Sadly for Duncan. But as many options as French wins in European Campan, competitions. The campaigns? No, oh, it's slightly on. more. Slightly more right. options than But Vava Voon, that's it. catchy. It's catchy, it's punchy. It's kind of, you know, it kind of speaks to the slightly enigmatic, racy sides to French football, I think. Yeah, a bit of 90s know, nostalgia in there as 90s, well. 90s, naughty nostalgia, which is, you know, kind of what the book is all about. Oh, okay. yeah. Nice. Um, and yeah, hitting, hitting the shelves in just over a month. That's now two books you've written, Tom, is it? Or is it more? Uh, yes, two. All right. Raph, how many two. are you on now? Mm. Too many to count, James. That's yeah. how many. Jesus, <laughs> a lot of books. Three. He's got it. It's three. Five. Five. Five books. Plus one translation. Wow. That's insane. And Duncan, you've written a book as well. Two. I'm on two. Are you on two? Yeah, I'm on what two. What are your yeah. ones? Uh, there was the... Op- to Joe Yearbook and then uh, I don't know if the, the yearbook books. counts Does well it, it was count? ri- all written by yeah. me so, oh, oh was it okay. yeah so right. yeah um, obviously the best thing here is that Alex Ferguson actually wrote more books than the Bronte sisters so always in, always in with face, the stat Bronte that sisters. defines the subject excellent we had uh, two shootouts this week in the Champions League have you got a stat about that Duncan uh, yeah <laughs> that it was the first one and this did confuse a lot of people yeah. since the 2016 final. 2,844 days. Mm. And then we got two and two days, etc. and so on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I guess amazing, that's, no? rest. that's yeah. because of the away goals rule being abolished. It makes, makes deadlocks more likely. Yeah, but that's been gone for a couple of seasons. True. No. So I was surprised by, you know, even mm. notwithstanding that detail. Yeah. I, a surprising I'm, stat. Perhaps you'll be taken aback by this little fact. That of the last five Champions League shootouts, four have featured Atletico Madrid. That's less surprising, I think. Oh, okay. All right then. They feel quite shootouty, don't they? They are a very shootouty team. <laughs> we'll. Um, but nevertheless. And of course, they've got the man in black, which is quite shootout, rele- you know, adjacent, isn't it? With his Saltburn style fall to the ground. Oh yeah, mm. drama. Uh, we'll get on to that drama and more. Are you very, sure? Very shortly. <laughs> He went, he went all the way? Well, we, um, the we'll also time. touch on, he said, gliding over that little segment of conversation, uh, we'll also touch on the extraordinary madness, perhaps the game of the midweek, which didn't take place in the Champions League, but in the Premier League at the Vitality Stadium, the Luton Bournemouth, Bournemouth Luton madness. Bournemouth 3 0 down at half time, roaring back to win 4 3. When was the last time something like that happened in the Premier League, Duncan Alexander? Yeah, that was the first time it happened since uh, Wolves Leicester in 2003. And only the um, fifth time it's ever happened in Premier League. 3 0 is officially not a dangerous lead, except very occasionally. Right. Wow. Talk about how dangerous it could be for Luton a little bit later on. But, Champions League, first of all, the quarterfinals are set now. You've got three Spanish sides in there, two German teams, two English outfits, and one French equipe. No Italians. A year ago, there were more sides from Serie A than any of the other leagues, but not this time. Big blow for the Italian coefficient, although they're still top, still top, as we await Thursday's games in the Europa and Conference League. The draw for who gets who in the quarterfinals is going to be coming up Friday from 11 o'clock UK time. We're going to start our look back on the midweek action with Arsenal Porto. Tuesday, Arsenal pit Porto on penalties. Duncan, you were there. I was there. All right. As Arsenal reached quarterfinals for the first time in 14 years. Penalty drama. What was that like at the Emirates? 
Very dramatic. Yes. Um, and kind of, there was a, I think there was a sense of calm. I think people, Arsenal got an incredible penalty record this year. They've scored every one, obviously, including... Nine out of nine in the Premier League. Yeah. Four we, out of four in this shootout. Four out of four in the Community Shield against Man City. Yeah, and I think people felt felt pretty calm. And, th- and so it was all down to David Rea, really. Yeah. Um, what could he do? And, and I think, you know, he's obviously had a... At points, difficult first season at the club, but I think this was the night that he really sort of emerged as a as a figure. And I think, given it came after the weekend when obviously Ramsdale came back in and you know did make some good saves, but also made a, a fairly bad error. Mm. Um, it did feel like this was the night that the the home supporters really kind of embraced him, and he became part of Arsenal. Yeah, so, yeah that was good. Two saves in the penalty shootout. Yeah. Nearly three as well. So. Nearly three, yeah. One more fortuitous than the other one. In the leg. When he touched leg. the ball onto the post and it came back and hit him on the back of the heels and still went wide. Wow. I mean, you know, how's your luck? How's, how's your luck, David? Luck? Pretty decent. Yeah. I guess he would, he would He'd, reply. The Athletic is a nice piece about what happened when the final whistle blew on the extra time period and he was straight over to an assistant manager on the bench who had the... Spreadsheet loaded up with all the Porto mm, penalty we, yeah. precedents. Both keepers were. Both actually were taken away to go through it. And we, it kind of shows how far we've come, really, I guess. Mm. Was it Ben Foster in the League Cup final that had it on an iPod mm. um, once? And an iPod? I think it was so an you iPod. You had to put headphones in and listen. <laughs> yeah, go to the left, to the left. Um, so, yeah, it was, We've you know, the, the research now, um, the whole, like, it's a lottery should be retired for good, I think. Although, funnily... Funnily enough, uh, Jan Oblak used that exact phrase about, perhaps being a little bit modest, about Atletico's own shootout with Inter the following night. But anyway... I mean, Didier Deschamps still says the penalty shootouts are a lottery, which mm. might explain why France's penalties in the 2022 World Cup final were as disastrous as they were. Because he doesn't think you can really prepare, which really puts him in the minority amongst modern elite coaches. But, you know... Mark and Mikel Arteta certainly would disagree. Further evidence, Rafa, that this Arsenal is different Arsenal? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it speaks for itself, that record. First time in 14 years. Mm. At their first attempt back in the Champions League. So the narrative that they're too young, too inexperienced, I think that's already being rolled back. We could see how sturdy they are defensively, a super solid side. Um, I, th- I think probably we're at the stage where so many people have said it that it's no longer a secret, but they are defending incredibly well and people perhaps don't always give them credit for it because we still have an idea of Arsenal as perhaps slightly flaky from the olden days mm. or the the beginnings of, of the Ateta reign. But now they're very hard to score against. And even when they're not quite in it, and I felt that with the ball, they didn't have that, money, that much going for themselves on Tuesday night, they... They're hard to break down right. and they just stay in the game and then they find maybe one moment and that's the side of a, a team that can go really far also in this competition mm. in my view. The moment on Tuesday coming from Leandro Trossard who had a busy night scoring a key goal also starring in about 35 billion social media posts mm. yeah. featuring him and referee Clement Turpin <laughs> and you have to say I'd it's never, extraordinary no I've never one noticed did, the no. resemblance and before yeah, yeah. and these and these are obviously you know a very high profile referee and a well known Premier League footballer but you put them side by side and they look I mean they look like twins Absolutely. it's incredible the I other mean, weird thing about this was that Turpin's reputation correct me if I'm wrong in France is very much of being the most card happy of officials and yet Tuesday he was mm. all about letting it flow let it get, yeah well yeah. that was interesting because producer Charlie said that as someone who'd watched it on the TV that the the commentators were being quite complimentary. Oh, no, they were. No, it wasn't the vibe at the, at the stadium. I mean, I mean, obviously, at, at the stadium. Is it ever? No, no, true. But as a, as a semi-neutral, no, <laughs> semi I did think he he was willfully lenient in the sense that there were times when Porto players were kicking the ball away. There were players going off injured that, that just came straight quite, back quite on. Quite a few robust like, challenges. It was obviously part of Porto's game mm. plan was to yeah. you know block the centre of the pitch. But, you know, but like Vendel against Saka, quite a lot but, of meaty challenges. The ball was in play for like an hour of, of 120 mm. minutes, and he ha- <laughs> he, he added a minute at the end of the first half and three at the end of the. I I joked uh, to my son that there'd probably be t- only two minutes at the end of the first half, and then when the board went up and it was one. Well, you must be delighted because uh, it's. A Alexander quipped. True, yeah, yeah, but it, yeah, it was um, 
it was unusual. I mean, you know, I'm not against it. It was a throwback display from a referee, but it was like all the all the recent edicts from from Pogmal and and IFAB and whoever were just forgotten. Well, and it was the same thing in the Atletico Inter game last night. That was refereed by Simon Marciniak in the same way. And I think one of the frustrations sometimes as a, a fan of Premier League football is that you often find yourself watching European games and finding that referees are clamping down on rough mm. and tumble that would be, you know, permitted in the Premier League. So, yeah, from, I guess, a kind of Anglo-centric glass. perspective, mm. it's, it feels welcome. But it must be a frustration if, if, you know, you're not used to that kind of refereeing. You're used to slightly stricter refereeing in your domestic league. And then in the Champions League, it becomes a bit of a free-for-all. Mm. But I don't think there were any scandals, were there, in either of those games? No, I mean, Kai Havertz ran into Sergio Conceição at one point. Which yes. Was, there was know. also Tweak Gate at the Metropolitana oh, when uh, Marcus Tor- Turam wandering yeah. busy hands Cup Cup action of the wrong kind mm. Mm. Yeah. 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 yeah but they laughed about it after they, they had a did. chortle together they didn't did. they um, Arsenal per- perhaps still some concerns about how effective they are breaking down a team that sits in a defensive block but they managed to get past Porto anyway they've now got several weeks off and also just to say Martin Odegaard's assist mm. was oh. a thing of Absolute beauty. And uh, Porto had marshaled that space so successfully with Varela and Gonzalez in front of the back four. That I, I'm like, he barely touched the ball in the first half, Erdegaard, up to that point. And he had to do so many different things in such a short space of time to create the space, wait for Trossard to make the run, thread the pass in between centre back and full back. And it was chef's kiss. Chef's kiss. Mm. Yep, a few weeks off for Arsenal now. And then. Manchester City, which will be huge for the Premier League and quite possibly could be significant in the Champions League's books. They could end up facing each other. Mm. Anyway, pens on Wednesday too. Atletico or Atletico for some against Inter at the Civitas Metropolitano football. eh? Atletico at the weekend had just been beaten 2-0 by Cadiz, a team that hadn't won a game since September. But they then, a couple of days later, beat a side that hadn't lost in September, Inter, who'd won 13 straight matches. How? I mean, it was a brilliant game. Like, very cagey, as you'd expect. Inter had 1-0 advantage from the first leg, Mm. obviously had the form. Atletico had no form whatsoever, but they're at home. There's the Diego Simeone factor. Um, And, yeah, it was fascinating. I mean, Atletico were quite happy to allow Inter to have the ball for quite a lot. Didn't really kind of engage them until they got to the halfway line. Inter was sort of threatening on the break a couple of times. Scored a really nicely constructed goal Mm. after about half an hour. Uh, Varela gets played in down the left and then outside the right foot pass to Federico Di Marco who scores and you thought okay well that's that into the best defensive team in you know, Europe's top five leagues they've now got a 2-0 advantage you know that's it's probably done two minutes later Griezmann scores Atletico get back into the game and then Atletico were on top most of the second half Turam squanders a brilliant chance with about 50 minutes to go clean through blazes over the crossbar Simeone sends on Memphis Depay, uh, who goes close a couple of times, hits the post, and then, I think with three minutes to go, takes this pass from Koke on the turn, drills it bottom left, and it, it, again, it lets go mainly on top in extra time, and then O'Black did the business in yeah. the, the shootout. Into undone by Depay, like that Sutton United goalkeeper, I couldn't help <laughs> but, but think. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, and then it went to, to penalties. But yeah, Inter could have buried this. First through Turam and then Barella with a big chance. But it was a night when their big names disappointed. Uh, Martinez as well in the shootout. Dreadful penalty. While, uh, certainly the, the substitutions in the duel between uh, Simone and Simeone, the substitutions were certainly hailed in the Italian press as, as, as being key, that move to bring on Memphis and also Raquel me. Uh, the uh, Gazetta this morning, they threw it away. Well, Marca in Spain went with brutal, brutal, yeah, which I think is a, a respect, a respectful brutal. And by heart and by oblack, that's how they won it, it says ass. Woof. I mean, brutal is also the penalty shootout. I've never hit, seen some penalties hit so hard. Absolutely. Yeah. If mm. the Arsenal penalty shootout was quite considered, you know, 
uh, intelligent penalty shootout. This was just a, a brawl of a penalty shootout. So absolute well, rocket. Pablo Correa fired one in off the crossbar and then kind of laughed <laughs> <laughs> almost, as if he couldn't believe that he managed to pull off this like absurdly unsavable penalty. Um, and yeah, and then a la Martinez Pressman, I think they call yeah, it. Yeah, very much a la Pressman. Rough night for James Horncastle, who was riding high on his correct prediction that Arsenal Porto would go to extra time, but it also tipped into to win the Champions League. So yeah, it didn't go so well. Oh well. Uh, Atletico through elsewhere. It was a Liga Two City and nil this week because Barcelona beat Napoli on Tuesday. Xavi afterwards coming out fighting. We were the clowns of the Champions League. He told the press, but who's laughing now? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure who is, who is laughing now. Probably Barcelona. Yeah. Oh, Pau Kubasi is laughing now. What a what a performance on a night when the kids stepped up. A beleaguered Barcelona with a win that with a game that they couldn't afford to lose because you know money. But fantastic, they became the first team in Champions League history, Duncan, to. Mm. Name a starting eleven with two players aged 17 or younger in it. Yamal, who we're getting used to, but Pau Kubasi. Yeah, I mean, we're used to the levers at Barcelona, but they've also got a secret lever where they just pull it and more young talent emerges. Wow. So. Well, it's Lamazir, isn't it? Yeah, It's been true. a while since we've seen a golden generation, but there's, there's talk that this could be something pretty special because mm. yeah, there's a whole crop of them coming through. I mean, it's inter- it, obviously, they're still a good team and they... But I think a lot of teams will hope to draw Barcelona in the quarterfinals, which is a which is a change from Champions League history. True, because this was a fine three-one victory over Napoli, but Napoli mm. Mm, uh, defensively a bit all at sea in that kind of three-minute spell in the first half when Barcelona effectively turned the tie around. A third goal coming later on through the not quite so young Robert Lewandowski. 94 now in 118 <laughs> Champions League games. He's the third highest scorer in the competitions, history, etc. and so on. Would you want Barcelona in the draw, Raf? If you ask me from a, a German perspective, mm. I think both Dortmund and Bayern would love to play right. against Barcelona. Bayern, do they have nice precedents against Barcelona? <laughs> Recently, yes. yes. But trips to the new Camp haven't always been oh, successful. Oh, yeah, oh, well, there, there you go. Mm. That will change their luck. Hmm. All right. But it's nice for La Liga in a season where their competition was deemed over by some that they've now got the most teams in the yeah. quarterfinals. Three Spanish sides, it's so true. Hey, the coefficient, who wants to know what's happening with the coefficient after all of that? Oh, yeah. Me, me. It's oh, exciting. Yeah. You recall that the top two nations will earn their leagues an extra spot hmm. in next year's very, very exciting looking Swiss. new Champions League format. Swiss. Very exciting, Swiss, synonymous, really. Uh, Italy still top with 16.571. Germany, Rafa, on 15.928. They've closed the gap a little bit there. England, who need to overtake one of the top two, are currently on 15 point nothing. But a lot of uh, of teams still involved. Yeah, Yeah. it's... But Europa and Conference League have the same weighting in this thing. Yeah, I think... Opt have got a predictive model and oh, yeah. Premier League's still on around 68, 70%. So what does Opta say? So the Premier League's most likely to get one of the spots and, and then um, Italy was, but mm. we know after this week we'll see how it's we'll changed. See. We'll mm. see. And in exciting coefficient news... <laughs> is it PS- France and Netherlands? It is France-related. PSV's elimination last night by Dortmund means yeah. that France are assured of holding on to fifth place in uh, the coefficient table for another season. So, another so that two means seasons, so. three teams and possibly a fourth through the playoffs. Yes, so great news for anyone who may have Ooh. a book about French football about to right. be released. Julian Laurent yesterday bouncing up and down on the sofa with that. That's the one game we haven't touched on yet, Rafa. PSV mm-hmm. beaten in a game they really could have at least taken to extra time away at the signal of Duna Park. No, loads of chances, especially after uh, Chucky Lozano came on. Uh, so yeah it began brilliantly for Dortmund it was 1-1 off the first leg Jaden Sancho with his second goal in two matches yes got from outside the box which I'm not big in stats but I've got a feeling this might be his first ever Stur- goal Duncan, outside leave from it, the mate, box leave it. Uh, certainly felt like a novelty seeing oh. him score from, from that distance um, great shot and, and Dortmund had a great start they were all over PSV the crowd were there there was a real sense of um, yeah energy and PSV were not ready for it for some reason they 
left loads of spaces. Dortmund had tons of chances and could have taken one or two more of them. And then things quietened down and then PSV towards the end, only towards the end of the first half, started really playing. And then a the second, the game swung completely their way. It was one-way traffic. Dortmund really couldn't hold on to the ball much. Uh, but rolled out their luck. Gregor Kobel again, very, very good performance from him. He's uh, probably their best player, uh, their keeper, Swiss keeper. And then in the last minute, Luke de Jong, three with lots of goal to aim at, sort of just leans back and blasts it over with his left foot. And almost immediately, Dortmund go the other end and score after Babadi slips and lets Royce through on goal. So, yeah, a good performance in terms of the attitude, resilience, passion. It had all those sort of basics. But as a football team, there's probably an argument that Dortmund are the worst side left in this competition. Mm. I mean, something quite nice that the group of death is the only group that's supplied two quarterfinalists. So, oh, yeah. Congrats, group of death. Indeed. Paris mm. Saint-Germain. The other side. They were Excellent. toughened up by the experience. Mm. And Going to St. James's Park and seeing men celebrate throw-ins. Yeah. Hardened in the fire of Group F. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Alrighty. Well, that was all quite exciting. But as previously mentioned, there's a strong case for the game of midweek actually taking place Many miles to the west of there, in Bournemouth. We'll be touching on the madness at Vitality next. Wednesday night at the Vitality, it was Bournemouth-Luton. This was Luton's game in hand. A win would take the Hatters out of the bottom three and drop Nottingham Forest into it. Their opponents, Bournemouth, had had one win in their previous eight. The Athletics' Elias Burke was at the Vitality for what unfolded, and he joins us now. Elias! Thank you for being Hi, with yeah. us. Hello. Wednesday night at the Vitality. There is Istanbul. Yeah, you can call it that. It was it was pretty insane, to be honest. Like, I mean, first half, Luton were just kind of all over Bournemouth. They were in full control. They looked like well on their way to a, to a massive win that obviously would have taken them out of the relegation zone. But in the second half, Bournemouth came roaring out. I'm not sure if it was something that Andoni Iraola said or Rob Edwards didn't say, but Luton looked shell-shocked and Bournemouth looked supremely confident, came out, and it was a massive second half. I mean, an unbelievable goal from Dominic Solanke and then, uh, yeah, a winner from Anton Semenyo, seven minutes until time. So, yeah, great game. It was fantastic. What was the atmosphere like at the Vitality? Booze at half-time for the home team, but then at the final whistle? Yeah, it was, it was strange, to be honest, because, I mean, even after Solanke scored that goal five minutes after half-time, People were still kind of, you know, warming to the fact that something might have happened. You know, it was 3-0 and then turned 3-1. So, you know, it would have taken a massive comeback from that point to get something. So, yeah, it was, you know, incredible. Second half, when Semenyo's goal in, uh, went in, the roar was just incredible. So, yeah, f final whistle, crazy. Bournemouth are on a really good streak at the moment. So, um, massive, massive disappointment for Luton, who uh, obviously, coming from half-time, looked like they might have been out of the relegation zone, but just kind of just collapsed towards the end. Indeed. It's rare when you get one of those moments when a team is absolutely on it and can almost score at will. And we certainly had that with the Cherries. After the Solanke goals, you mentioned, uh, were three goals in the space of, what, 14 minutes to totally turn things around? Yeah, Solanke's goal, as I said, was, was brilliant. And then the second goal from Zabani was, was from a corner. It was a header. Uh, it looked to have kind of been cleared off the line, but, you know, the referee gave it. It crossed the line. And then just a few minutes later, Semenyo went and scored a great finish with his left foot to make it 3-3. And then from that point, it was, I think, 15 minutes after until Semenyo finally found the winner. So it was a case of, like, would they find it? Would they not? Would it kind of peter out to a three-all draw? Peter out is maybe the wrong phrase for that kind of game. But, uh, but yeah, they, they found the winner. And uh, it, was, it was a hectic 15 minutes after the second half started, yeah. Mm. Uh, your favourite game of the season so far? I'd have to say so. I mean, definitely the best game that I've been to. Um, yeah, as I say, the atmosphere was was incredible. The the goals were amazing, and uh, it, it, you know the fact that Luton were in a such a precarious position made it all the more exciting. The fact that they kind of collapsed towards the end. Yeah. All right, Elias, magnificent. Uh, enjoy your journey home, and congratulations for picking the right game to go to on Wednesday. Yeah, exactly. Cheers. Thank you, Elias Burke, who heads back Londonwards with a. Less heavy heart than his Luton counterparts the previous night. 
They must have been absolutely gutted by that. Eight matches now without a win in all competitions, but also to see yourself collapse like that in the second half, what kind of repercussions do you anticipate? Well, I mean, it's interesting because if you look at Luton's recent form, around the turn of the year, they hit a bit of a purple patch. One at home to Newcastle, one at Sheffield United, thrash Brighton 4 0. And in their next game, they were 4 2 up away at Newcastle with 25 minutes to play. Since then, they haven't won a game and won seven league games without a win. Um, and as annoying as going 4 2 up at Newcastle and not winning would have been, I suspect going 3 0 up at relatively lowly Bournemouth and mm. losing uh, will have stung quite it, a lot. It leaves them three points behind Nottingham Forest still now with no games in hand. Maybe a little bit of a PSR uh, ace up their sleeve. We shall see. But meantime, who should they be facing this weekend? But <laughs> Nottingham Forest, this is back at Kenilworth Road. Should be a feisty affair. A lot on this one, either side of the dotted line. I mean, ordinarily it would feel like a bit of a relegation six-pointer. Hmm. In the, and particularly since if Forest win, they would go six points clear of Luton. Right. Right. Obviously, the liter- a literal the relegation six-pointer. But then again, six points could well be. Well, well that's what? the thing. Hmm. You could just lose it like that. And that does make it hard to kind of know how much significance there is. I mean, Luton are obviously the only team who stand any chance of falling themselves out the bottom three, hmm. you would think. You would think. And have looked the most kind of, you know kind of upwardly mobile and interesting team of the three promoted teams since the start of the season. Forrest and Everton, Brentford as well are only just above them. But the fact that there is this possibility of a points reduction against Forrest, further points reduction against Everton means that it is, yeah, it's sort of hard to pronounce with any kind of certainty mm. on the significance of this game. All right. I mean, they do. That, I mean, it is obviously the, significant. Luton's don't don't get me wrong. Uh, it's still significant. <laughs> Luton's remaining home games are all fairly winnable. They've got, you know, Bournemouth at home, <laughs> so maybe not. But they've got Everton at home as well, Brentford, Fulham. So I think they're still in with, with a very good chat, even without points deduction, mm. asterisk action. Do but, have, mm. yeah. Mm. But, this, I mean, you know, this game is a must win for both teams, I would nice. say. Forest were 2 0 up. In the reverse fixture, uh, the reverse fixture at the City Ground, here's the thing, saw Forrest 2-0 up and they, they threw that lead away. It was the Hatters who stormed back to claim a point. That was in October. Yeah. Anyway, well, that's going to be absolutely fascinating. Again, not on TV in the UK, certainly, because it's a Saturday 3 o'clock game. There are only three other matches this weekend in the Premier League. You're bottom of the table, Burnley hosting Brentford. That's also Saturday at 3. B's currently... Five points clear of the relegation scrap. Fulham take on Spurs at 5.30. And at 2 o'clock on Sunday, West Ham, Aston Villa, a.k.a. the David Cameron Line Tory Classico. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, I, emotions in the Cameron household, mm? you think, for that one. Yeah. Although yeah. they get the colours right, so, you know. Yeah. Mm. He's it, guaranteed to win as well, when you support both teams. I would... I would posit that this is the most annoying and frustrating weekend of action of the season because you have four Premier League games, you have four FA Cup games, they all cross over with each other. It's just really bitty and it shouldn't happen. Do you feel? Mm. Sometimes it's nice when narratives yeah. intertwine. Well, fun for all the family. For the FA Cup lovers, mm. for the I don't yeah, want a buffet, I want, a, I want a high quality hour league meal. Perhaps you'll get one or four of those because there, you know, there are interesting elements to all these games. West Ham, Villa, both teams will be in action Thursday night in pretty pretty delicately poised matches in the Europa League and Conference League. Villa have John McGinn suspended. They've never won at the London Stadium. Good Lord. In fact, they haven't won away to the Hammers uh, since uh, a match at Upton Park 13 years ago. I wonder if you can name who the two managers were 13 years ago for West Ham and Aston Villa. So that's what, 2011? Twen- Can name the Prime Minister. Uh, Avram Grant. Avram Grant was one. But who was in charge for Aston Villa? Listener? Is it a Frenchman? Is it Remy Gard? No. Funnily enough, that's what I'd thought. But producer Charlie reveals it was actually his co-national, his fellow countryman, as they say, <laughs> Gerard Houllier. Gerard Houllier. Yeah. Gerard Houllier. Oh, yeah. Yeah. About that. Anyway, that's enough West Ham. Aston Villa preview. As I say, they're playing Thursday night. 
And then they'll play Sunday at 2 and we'll review it on Sunday evening as we will Fulham Spurs, which comes up Saturday tea time. You can watch this on Sky, actually. Although it clashes with Man City Newcastle in the FA Cup, Duncan. Frustration. Yeah. Big weekend in the, the race for the top four. You think particularly in the light of that Spurs winner Villa top last weekend. Or the, top, or, or the top five, whatever it mm-hmm. is. Because, um, you know, in the space of that one match, you yeah. think Spurs have now got the advantage. Probably right. have them as favourites, I think, perhaps slightly to finish up above Villa. Perhaps. Um, mm. Mm. And also, that point notwithstanding, on Saturday, 3 o'clock, you've got Burnley-Brentford. Burnley winless in their last eight. Brentford have won just three of the last 17. So, yeah. Anyway, as I say, we'll review all of that come Sunday evening and we'll also be talking about Duncan the FA Cup which is taking place this weekend as well the quarterfinals should we move on to that the sixth round the sixth round which uh, we'll get on to next people did call it the sixth round didn't they traditionally Mm -hmm. you used to get people straight into the semis people used to get annoyed if you called it the quarterfinals no it's the sixth round it's like Oh, yeah. That'll be after the fifth round next, Duncan. And when they've come for the fifth round, what they call that? when they came for the sixth round, I said nothing. Yeah. And they came for the fifth round, I said nothing. <laughs> mm. If they come for the third round, they'll be in trouble. The round, round of, of sixty-four. The round of, what round they call the, the final, round of the two hundred and fifty-two no. or whatever. The half mm. final. Yeah, I don't know. All right. Anyway, more top FA Cup chat like this next. All right. <clears throat> Cup news. Oh, lovely PSG. 3-1 victory over Nice Yes, midweek in the, the Coupe de France in yeah. the round of Septien. It's confusing in France because the quarterfinals are Le Car. No, actually, that isn't confusing. It's the one before. The last 16 is the huitième de finale. We, yeah, so it's the one, yeah. one yeah. over eight. Yeah. You do, or it, 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 di does, finale, yeah. it makes mathematical well, sense, but if you're not very good with numbers, I, it throws me. Right. Uh, eighth final. Kylian think, Mbappe did quite a number. Yes, Kylian Mbappe, who is no longer first choice in the league because Luis Enrique is preparing the team for next season. Mm, so course. he only now starts in the Champions League and the Cup. So having been rested at the weekend, he was fresh to open the scoring. In quite in some a, fashion. Yeah, and in a pretty one-sided victory over a Nice team who are slithering down the league and standings and out of the Cup um, in, in pretty... Uh, Dispiriting fashion after mm. a pretty positive first half of the season. Okay. The Sir Jim Ratcliffe effect in full effect. Nice. Uh, cup action in Germany as well, Rafa. Any big stories there? No, nothing. Just the usual. Saarbrücken. Another, another top team league knocked out by Saarbrücken. Saarbrücken. So Saarbrücken are from where? The which Saarland. division? So is it third? Third div- division. Third division. And they've already knocked Bayern out. And then they beat Eintracht Frankfurt in the, uh, how do you say, eighth? Achtelfinale. Uh, yeah, there you go. Last 16. And good Lord. And then they did Gladbach with a 93rd minute goal. Incredible. Into the semifinals they go. Where they're going to be playing Kaiserslautern out of uh, Bundesliga's Vi, I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, that's... So that leaves Leverkusen as the only Bundesliga side left in this competition. Right. They've got Dusseldorf mm. in their semi-final, Dusseldorf from Bundesliga 2. And that's never happened before. Okay. Only one Bundesliga team in the last four. Has has there ever been a cup run like Saarbrücken? Yes, there has been. Um, it used to be that the amateur sides from the big Bundesliga teams were allowed to play in the cup as well. Mm. And there was a run by Hertha BC 2 from either the third or fourth division all the way to the final. Wow. Where they played Leverkusen. No way. And lost. Uh, when was that? 1993. Good Lord. Knowledge, right? A bit like the 1980 Copa del Rey final, which was between Real Madrid and their reserve team. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. And Real Madrid won 6-1, which... Uh, which one, though? A tough... Yeah, well, the first team, I'm sure it was a tough old battle. <laughs> oh, bless. Anyway, FA Cup called the finals for us, uh, aka sixth round. You've got 12-15 on Saturday, Wolves Coventry... Their first meeting in a decade at 5.30 on Saturday. Clashing, as mentioned, with Fulham Spurs, it's Man City, Newcastle. Sunday, 12.45, Chelsea meet Leicester in a repeat of the 2021 final. And at 3.30, Man United, Liverpool. Woo! Feels like we should start with that one. How big is Man United, Liverpool for Man United in particular? I think it's very big. 
I think if United win, I wouldn't say it's a, a, a potential season saver, Ooh. but, you know... It sort of is. Kind of. I mean, it's basically all they've got left, it's all they've pretty got. much. Um, they're not going to get Champions League. I but think if they, they can still get knock, fifth, couldn't they? I yeah. keep forgetting that fifth is good enough. Mm. Yeah, I need to need to get my head around. But they only need Liverpool to probably win the Europa League, so they'll, they can cheer them on. How many on. points are they off fifth place? They are currently six points off fifth place, and fifth place Tottenham have a game in hand. Yeah, so even so fifth place is looking unlikely, unlikely. You would, unless you know Villa or Spurs collapse completely. Mm. But if they can knock Liverpool out of the FA Cup off their perch, off their off their perch. Sort of, mm. and, and deny Jurgen Klopp a, the quadruple a in tatters. Quadruple dreams in tatters. They get a trip to Wembley. Mm. Um, you know, get a kind draw, get into the final. I think if Ten Hag wins the FA Cup this season, it gets harder for Ineos to sack him. Which is right. not to say that they won't sack him, but I mean, it's you know, it's a, it's another trophy for him having won the League Cup last season. Whereas if they lose um, to what will probably be another quite weakened Liverpool team because of you know injuries mm. and, and absentees it's kind of a, another nail in the Ten Hag coffin I think that nail is sealed up and whatever it is you're going to do with coffin I don't want to get into coffin talk but hey, Joe, you know, there's, there's a lot of speculation about subject. who's coming in I heard the it's name Gareth subject. Southgate how about that Gareth Southgate as a yeah I know but anyway it would be quite the achievement if they were to get past Liverpool and then win the FA Cup, their record against Jurgen Klopp's side, not good. They've won only three of their last 18 meetings. There was obviously the 5 the 0 in the Premier League a few years back, which mm. Liverpool e I mean, that was probably the, the worst thing for United was that Liverpool eased up, didn't they? Sort of basically took it easy in the second half. So it's the 7 0, of course. Must yeah. forget. 7 0 was at Anfield, yeah, but the, the, the 5 0 at Old Trafford, particularly painful. The last meeting came. Only last December, that was at Anfield, and it was nil-nil. This was in the Premier League. But by and large, Liverpool have Man United's number of late. Running on pure emotion right now, Liverpool. Well, I'm not so sure, James. I mean, I asked uh, Klopp after that draw against City last week, what is the difference? They had so many injuries last year, and the form kind of collapsed, and Klopp wouldn't stop talking about the injuries and how they have no rhythm and they can't change. And what is it? why is it so different this year? And he didn't really answer it straightforward, but I think it came down to basically saying he trusts the subs and that includes this wave of youngsters more than perhaps he did last year and feels more comfortable rotating, feels more comfortable playing them. Um, uh, Someone like Conor Bradley, suddenly a huge asset to this team. Before that, they had Robertson and really no one um, to replace him with, or when Trent was out, then it was a huge drop as well. So um, it seems to work better, and I think they still have enough. Don't forget, they will probably rest a lot of players for the second leg against Sparta Park. So they'll come into this game fairly fresh, mm. I think, and they're huge favourites. I mean, it is, it is remarkable, I think, what Liverpool have achieved in the last couple of weeks with all these absentees and I think you talk about you know Klopp's influence on Liverpool as he nears the end of his tenure to have successfully imbued his squad with the kind of qualities he wants to see to such an extent Mm. that you've got teenagers coming into the first 11 with almost zero first team experience and managing to put in the kinds of performance they put in against Chelsea in the League Cup final against City last weekend in the Premier League. I think that they're, without getting too carried away about it, but, you know, given that we are beginning to reflect on his legacy um, I think the fact that he is he's that Liverpool remain as competitive as they are, still in the hunt for Premier League titles, still in the cup, still in the Europa League, um, producing these performances with all these like young players and the squad creaking at the hinges, it you know, it, it, it kind of shows that there is something, you know, that has been created that is that is, that is very strong. It's the, it's the Klopp Dameron. Would that be right, Rafa? Yeah. yeah. Klopp Dameron. 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 Oh, okay. I I know what Tom's saying, but I, I think the youngsters I disagree. All, not disagree, disagree so much, but I would point out that being. the youngsters are coming in in positions where youngsters can thrive, sort of out wide, full what, back. centre back? Mm, centre back against yeah. Haaland? Yeah, but I think they've still got Van Dijk there. I think they've still got a spine. The, the mid, you know, McAllister's been brilliant since the turn of the year. They've, they've still got, all right, Jota's at the moment, they've still got a rotating cast of forwards. I think that that's the difference to last year when it really did feel like they were kind of running on empty, even the first team players. So Now um, running on emotion. 
Nice. I think Saudi Arabia have done a huge favor to this team. Yeah. It didn't perhaps feel like it at the time, but losing Fabinho and Henderson mm. forced Klopp into a bigger makeover than perhaps he had anticipated. Mm. And the midfield looks so much an endo. F- happier, fresher. Endo, who took some time before he got going, I think had to adjust to the tempo, now is... Is, is a brilliant player in this position and uh, shows you why he was so highly rated in Stuttgart. It's worked out really well for this team. Meanwhile, the news this week that Michael Edwards, the former sporting director, is going to be returning and apparently bringing the current Bournemouth sporting director, former Golanto panellist and friend of the, of the show, Richard Hughes, with him. Why is that so important? Apparently it's an FSG appointment rather than a Liverpool one. So he sits sort of up above Liverpool in a way and will also be responsible for possibly a second club that they're buying. Um, but it shows you how I think Liverpool, maybe slightly counterintuitively, um, but I think it makes a lot of sense, a moving away from the all-powerful manager that Klopp has become. He didn't set out to be that that kind of manager. I think FSG didn't think he would evolve into that manager, having worked always under sporting director uh, at Dortmund and in Mainz, um, to having the most powerful figure above mm. running things and then appointing the next manager and making sure that there's a there's a sort of identity and a structure that's independent of of whoever's manager at the time. Which makes it quite neat that they're playing Manchester United this weekend because obviously when Ferguson left, United just tried to carry on with the, the structure they had, but without Alex Ferguson. And I mean, I guess there wasn't still, really a structure. No, exactly. So and also having Michael Edwards kind of floating above the football operations is almost a physical manifestation of mm. the "How am I doing, boss?" Liverpool meme. Mm. Um, so that's an, you know that's another box ticked. Very which nice. I'm sure entered into their thinking. If you're thinking the name sounds familiar, listener, of course he was the sporting director who brought in Klopp, as well as uh, Mo Salah, Firmino, Sadio Mane, Alisson and Virgil van Dijk. He also, and this is key, convinced Barcelona to part with 142 million for Coutinho. And he still doesn't have a Wikipedia page. Is that right? My dad was, I wrote a piece about him about, I don't know, Five years ago, oh, yeah. and the intro was like, you know, there's loads of Michael Edwards on Wikipedia, but not this one. Okay. And I remember thinking, oh, that'll get sorted out at some point because he's got an influential figure mm. in uh, in English football's recent history. Still, still no sign of it. You checked? Have I, you? I check. All right. Regularly. <clears throat> does Richard Hughes have a Wikipedia page? Because he's he a does. lovely chat. Yes. Former Atlanta youth product, featured for Portsmouth, been on this show, and yeah. Lovely chat. Very nice, man. Very nice I interviewed man. him for that very piece. And Did he you? was very nice. Yeah, no. Nice to get some sporting director chat. Well, uh, with I mean, it's a slightly trite point, but with clubs now unable to buy players because of PSR, oh, like, yeah. exchanging sporting di- directors is the new is the new club call. How are Man United doing on their big sporting director signing? Because that was it's, it's heralded a, as being a game changer for them. But it's a very important time now for gardening. Yeah. Because... Um, you know, first shoots and stuff. Mm? Yeah. Okay. So they can't leave now. Everyone's but tending their roses. Very good. Potential uh, oh, yeah. um, green shoots of recovery for United on Clever. the pitch in the looks like Rasmus Hoyland might be back, which would make a big Ooh. difference uh, if he's fit. And the, their defensive injury crisis appears to be easing slightly as well. Mason Mount. What? Remember him? He's also back in training Mm. this week. Thanks for that, Tom. What have you got to say about Man City's clash with Newcastle? Newcastle, who knocked City out of the Carabao Cup, of course, this season. No, that was back at theirs. This is at the Etihad. It feels like Newcastle's season is over already. It's like they're sort of slightly on the beach. The FA Cup, the same competition that Erling Haaland of Man City has scored eight goals in in his career, but only in two matches. There was a hat-trick against Burnley last season. And then in the last round of this year's tournament, five goals against Luton. I mean, a year ago you would have said, OK, Newcastle are tough to beat. They can cause problems for, um, for City, but... Not Whenever anymore. I've seen them this year, they've been defensively shambolic, including Shambolic. that one game against Liverpool where they gave up the highest XG in Seven XG history. Yeah, <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. So it's it's hard to see anything but a 
very successful after I mean, they, Erling Haaland. They mm. needed a good cut run, Newcastle, which they kind of have had against the quarterfinals. But the one thing they didn't want was to get drawn away to Manchester City. And that's what's happened. That's what's happened, yeah. Maybe Although, oh. crumb of comfort, potentially. Mm. I mean, City have been quite scratchy of late. They, I mean, OK, they annihilated Luton in the previous round, but their mm. league form, OK, they're still winning <laughs> almost every game. <laughs> right. But they haven't, been, that. they haven't been like taking teams to the cleaners. You know, drew at home to Chelsea, 1-0 against Brentford, 1-0 at Bournemouth. Weren't particularly convincing against Liverpool last weekend. Slightly fortunate, probably, uh, not to concede a penalty right at the end. So it's not like they're absolutely... Um, you know, dismantling teams. Although right. I fully expect them to dismantle, <laughs> dismantle Newcastle. Newcastle. Okay. All right, there you go. That's Man City, Newcastle. Man City, not the top scorers in the FA Cup this season. Do you know who is? Coventry City. Coventry City. 16 goals. Woof. And they're taking on Wolves this weekend for the first time in a decade. Wolves with all sorts of injury issues. Neto going off, of course. Last weekend, Wang Hee Chan also out the picture, Matez Cunha. Mm -hmm. Well, if Coventry win, let me just say this, it'll be the fourth time in eight seasons that Mark Robbins of FA Cup fame mm. has taken the Sky Blues to Wembley. So that's very impressive. Yeah. Yeah, they're a good team, Coventry. Obviously, they lost a few key players last season when they didn't go up. Obviously, lost to Luton in the in the playoff final, but they've, they've bounced back really well and... Um, you know, they will fancy their chances against the depleted Wolves, although I'm sure, you know, Wolves are in such a good position now in the league that I'm sure Gary O'Neill knows this is a, a rare opportunity to progress them uh, to Wembley, at least, in mm. the semis. But, um, yeah. I mean, the last time Coventry won an FA Cup quarter final was back in 1987. Is and that we right? all know what happened then. Well, indeed. It would be great to see Coventry in the final. The yeah. Wonder Duncan. Yeah, Keith Houchin. Yeah. And all that. John Siller. Yeah, you John Sillers, you Keith Houchins. You Granada Bat. Do they sponsor by Granada Bat? I believe they were. Before my time, I'm afraid. Wow. Rather more recently, the 2021 final saw Chelsea take on Leicester with the Foxes emerging victorious. Those two teams meet again in the Cup Sunday lunchtime. The Blues, who had a 3 2 victory against Newcastle on Monday night after our previous show with a fantastic goal from Mikhailo Mudrik. Ooh. The Foxes are currently top of the championship, but dropping points all over. They've only picked up indeed four from the last 15 available. It'd Six. be very on brand, I think, for Chelsea to have a good good cup run. Yeah. Because they remind you a little bit of the Chelsea of, sort of the late 90s, early 2000s, mm. always pretty shambolic in the league maybe that's too strong a word but Incons inconsistent yeah. um, but individuals that can decide big games and yeah I think whenever I've seen them play recently I, I felt that they always just feel a little bit short of clicking there could some something could happen any given moment in both directions admittedly but there is a lot of quality there Mm -mm. Um, I disagree with Tim Sherwood slightly on that on that <laughs> count. Well, what was Tim Sherwood's point? The post-match interview after the Chelsea Newcastle game on Monday mm. with Cole Palmer, who mm. was again exceptional, goal and an assist. And Sherwood basically says, "Oh, if you only had some decent players to play with, that's what you need, don't you, Cole? You need the club to buy some better players because the ones you're playing with aren't good enough." Was he being provocative? Given no, he, I think he thought outlay? he was. I think he thought, as he probably often does, that he was he was sharing some searing insight that needed, nay, demanded okay. to be you know shared with uh, the viewing public and put Cole Palmer in a really awkward position. Mm. And he sort of did his best to you know diplomatically fend off Sherwood's. Uh, Sherwood's question. In terms of Chelsea's performance on Monday, were was that signs of your, your springtime green shoots and things? I mean, yeah. Well, as Raf says, every now and again you watch Chelsea and you think, OK, I can see what they're trying to do here. You know, there is now more consistency in Pochettino's team selection. You know, you know, who's going to play where. You know, Palmer is now the key man. The midfield uh, is, you know, is, is pretty settled. Um, and 
you know, occasionally they, they give you these these signs that they're capable of of you know great things, and they produce some impressive performances this season. You know, I still think they were quite unfortunate against Liverpool in the in the League Cup final, but they're never very far away from like the wheels coming off and you know losing a game they shouldn't lose. I mean, you know, you'd have them as strong favourites against Leicester, I think, particularly given Leicester's uh, pretty disappointing recent league form. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's you know something is happening at Chelsea. I'm not sure what it is mm. necessarily, okay. but something. But if, if, imagine it's like a scientific experiment. Mm. Test tubes full of the one multicolored point, liquids are bubbling, and at some point it, it may produce. The one point two billion amazing. spend is slowly coming to fruition. I think. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. nice. Well, uh, we'll get further evidence one way or another Sunday, a quarter to one. The win over Newcastle, one of two big Chelsea stories. This week, the other being the news that with Maurizio Sarri unexpectedly resigning as Lazio manager on Tuesday, he'd had enough. Players weren't with him, he said. And with that same day, Rafa Benitez being dismissed by Celta Vigo, the 10 Chelsea managers that preceded their current man Pochettino will all be, as it stands, out of work in June 2024. Get your heads around that. This stat comes courtesy of Rob uh, at Journalism RP on at journalism socials. underscore RP. Un- underscore it. RP. Thank you. And yeah, he points out that everybody who had that role, that cursed role before Pochettino is either out of work or in one case will be out of work barring changes and that's Thomas Tuchel I'm referring to, come this June. The the 10 in question being Graham Potter, Thomas Tuchel, Frank Lampard, although he's got a lucrative career in advertising, I see, uh, Maurizio Sarri, that man Antonio Conte, Gus Hiddink, Jose Mourinho, Rafa Benitez, Roberto Di Matteo, and who's the other one? AVB. AVB, who's currently uh, running for the presidency of Porto, as it happens. So no longer interested in such humdrum matters as managing. He's got Paris Dakar and club presidency and that sort of thing going on. I mean, it's very on brand, isn't it, mm. for Chelsea? This, I mean, it's extraordinary, stuff. though, isn't it? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, it is. It is well, a, a poison's chalice. The, the, they they put the chalice to their lips, and, and you know, now they're all they sucked. But now they're all dead. What's dead, great is dead, if Chelsea came out tomorrow sleeping. and appointed any one of those managers, you wouldn't yeah. be that surprised. Yeah. You'd be like, uh, yeah, or all get them back. Yeah, <laughs> Sarri, Graham Potter, I mean, the dream team. Like kind of Ocean's Eleven. Which would you pick? Which would you pick? Chelsea Ten. Um, I haven't seen Gus Hiddink for a while. I, I don't know. Hmm. I might go. Well, are we is it who would you pick to win games and achieve things? Or who would you win? I think I'd probably thing. go. Yeah, I'd go Benitez. So I think because Chelsea fans really love him, they, they and he did win a European yeah. trophy for them. So you know, got, yeah. got unfinished, heritage. unfinished business. That'd be the hashtag. Hmm. <laughs> well, there you go. We'll see whether Pochettino can survive his sip from the poison chalice and perhaps the game against Leicester this weekend will be key in that sense we as mentioned will be back on Sunday Sunday evening reviewing the outcome of that and all the other business Uh, for now though I think that's probably it listener you're free to go about your life Duncan thank you so much for being with us and Tom and Rafa and Liam and Charlie in the booth and you listener been great having your company do join us sunday for now from all of us here it's goodbye the totally football show podcast is available three times a week bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about we've got views we've got stats we've got analysis we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free so have a listen on spotify or apple podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below